Hello, my name is Seth Hutchinson. I'm a junior at Punahou School in Honolulu, Hawaii, and today I'm talking with Kumu Kealohi, who is a Hawaiian Studies teacher and also the director of Kauai Valley Learning Center, which is the hub of Hawaiian Studies at Punahou School. Um, today, I'm hoping to gain a deeper understanding of environmental racism in Hawaii and how it pertains to the native population. So, I guess before we start, before we get into environmental racism, a little bit about you. I, I know that you you're a Punahou graduate, um, mm -hmm. and I was kind of wondering what made you want to come back to Punahou and teach, and sort of what's your kuleana, and is it is Punahou related to that? Yeah, I, I think that's a great place to start. I um, I tell this story often, and uh, it's an interesting story because I come from a place called Waiahole <clears throat> on the island of Oahu. Uh, it's a rural community. Uh, I grew up on a taro farm, and my family, till this day, still taro farmers, my parents, um, you know, very low income, the sustainable farming um, community. And I went to a elementary school called Waiahole Elementary, 60 to 100 kids on any given year. Uh, and when I got into Punahou in seventh grade, uh, it was a big shift for me. It was a big, uh, it was a different world. Getting on the bus every morning at 530, riding to school. And I didn't, although I'm, you know, I'm fair skinned. I, I looked like a lot of my classmates. I didn't feel like a lot of my classmates because right. I grew up in quite a different way in a different family doing different things. You know, my mom owns a poi business. <clears throat> I, I would work in her business. I would work on the farm. And so I didn't have free weekends to go gallivanting or to hang out at the beach or do those things. And so my social life was, you know, uh, restricted to riding the bus and being at school as a softball player, stayed till late at night. And I didn't find that Punahou uh, was very um, comfort comfortable for me. It wasn't a comfortable experience. And so when I left Punahou in 1999, graduated, I swore I would never come back to this place. Uh, and so interestingly, um, I, I studied uh, Hawaiian language at UH Hilo, graduated with my BA in Hawaiian studies and psychology. Right. I got my teaching certificate in an indigenous education program and then started working on my master's pretty early, uh, which took me nine years to my master's in um, Hawaiian language and literature. Mm -hmm. uh, meanwhile, I was teaching at a Hawaiian immersion school on the Big Island, Keikulo Navahio Kalanio Pu'u. And I thought that that would be my life um, in Hawaiian language, teaching Hawaiian immersion kids. And over the course of that time, I, I decided that I started to realize that I had some ideas, some philosophical ideas about education. Mm -hmm. And um, at some point, I wanted to, you know, try them out and, and see whether or not Hawaiian education could exist in a place like Punahou. And um, I got the opportunity to come back to Punahou because I, you know, pay attention to my bulletin, read my bulletin religiously as an alum, uh, and realized that Punahou really invests in its teachers. And they understand that teachers are sort of the front line for education. And after realizing that Punahou had been in existence for a hundred and, you know, now 80 something years, um, they started to think about the fact that the, Punahou must be doing something right. Right. And I would love to learn what that something right is, because in order to make our immersion schools more sustainable or to um, localize place based education more sustainable, <clears throat> I wanted to learn a little bit more about what makes an institution sustainable. And that was the thing that that sort of brought me back to Punahou. Mm -hmm. uh, I really want to learn from this place. Uh, and I've taken the opportunity to be back here as an adult and as a professional uh, in order to add to you know my learning about what makes institutions and programs sustainable in hopes of helping um, the immersion program and, and smaller local uh, schools so that's really the kuleana that i feel like i have yeah that, that was honestly uh, <laughs> i don't know it was really interesting um i i can't i don't have the same the same uh like history as i not history but i guess i don't have the same experience as you do but I mm -hmm. used to go to Hawaii Preparatory Academy on the Big Island in Waimea, and then mm. I transferred to Punahou as a uh, sophomore. And like, no, no hate to Hawaii Preparatory Academy; they're great. The education's great, but coming right. to Punahou, I realized that there's a whole different level. There's like, it's like a, almost like a higher level of education that's really right. precise and thought out. And I think people that graduate Punahou, they go, they go to the mainland, wherever else they want to go. They live their life, but then they realize they they come back to Hawaii and they realize how 
how well Punahou, or how good Punahou is at educating kids and making them prepared for the real world. So, I would agree, and I don't think I, I appreciated that as a student until I I got to college and I realized, oh man, I like I am ready for this. Like, right, you know, looking at my classmates and just being in in a space of being super comfortable with academics and being in college and being like, yeah, I can do this. This is this is easy for me. I do agree in that. Punahou really prepares you to 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 sort of walk down that path. Yeah, I totally sure. agree. So, um, in this podcast, we are going to be focusing on environmental racism. So, I did want to read a definition that I got online from okay. Civil Beat, and it says, "Environmental racism doesn't mean that the physical environment is racist. It's an acknowledgement that people of color have been systematically excluded from decision making and therefore unequally protected against environmental hazards." said Devin Corsia Payne Sturgis, who is a public health expert. And then she later went on to say that um, it's really about those institutional rules, um, government and corporate actions and decisions that deliberately target certain communities for the least desirable land values, which would result in disproportionate exposure to toxic chemicals and, hazard and hazardous waste. Uh, okay. do, you, do you agree with this definition or like, is there anything that you wanna add? <laughs> um... I, I'm still processing it, but I think in in large part, I would I would agree uh, mm -hmm. on the definition. Um, I think there are definitely some added elements of. So there's the institution, there's systematic, you know, racism. Mm -hmm. There are decision making pieces that are um, uh, sort of a part of that. Yeah, I think I think I I think I would agree. I would think that. Um, in Hawaii specifically, that there should be in that definition uh, some sort of acknowledgement of, of, of culture and history um, and, and erasure history, you know, like being taught in schools and curriculum as far as education goes. Yeah. I think there, so, so that you could get nitpicky and you could uh, figure out all the different contexts in which it, it exists, but uh, I'm not sure how many of those make it into the definition. But I think by that definition that you're using, it leads us into a, a lot of different contexts for applying that definition um, in Hawaii, for sure. But yeah, I totally agree. I think culture is a big part and needs to be looked at more deeply. Um, also, for, for people that are listening that might not know any examples of environmental racism, uh, easily the most famous, or not, yeah, I guess famous and like most well known is the Flint, Michigan water crisis that we've all seen about, mm -hmm. that we've all seen in the news. Um, it's a terrible thing, and the people living in Flint, Michigan, really had no choice. They had they just had to endure what happened to their to their town. Um, so moving more towards uh, like history long ago in Hawaii, um, could you tell me about basically what it was like to what it was like to live as as a native person here before the white man came, like before before this land was colonized? Like what was the way of life back then? Because I know. Uh, the, the land was divided into different districts that were uh, sort of controlled by chiefs. Yeah. If you could give some so, time to that. I just give, I give a brief history that I think sets us up to understanding um, the, the sort of unique relationship that the native people of Hawaii, the Hawaiians, mm -hmm. have with this, this place that needs to be understood in order to sort of contextualize the, the, the history and its ramifications, yeah? Um, so quickly, in, in terms of a nutshell, um, the origin story of Hawaii is where we, we begin. And one of the more accepted, widely accepted and believed stories that is the, the genesis of the Hawaiian people is the, um, the so before anything existed, uh, w this place was a realm of the gods. It was dark, it was um, chaotic, and you could sort of maybe liken it to like the, the time of the Big Bang, right? The, mm -hmm. the primordial soup and the, the chaos of that that world. Um, the, the joining of two sort of primary uh, deities or gods of the, that time, Wakea and Papa. Um, Papa begins to birth the islands mm. uh, and births these islands, Hawaii Island, uh, the big island, uh, Maui, Kaho'olawe, uh, and then so on and so forth. These islands come from a place of being birthed. And um, along the way, uh, there, there are other birthings that happen, but then the birthing of the first human child who is born, stillborn, uh, to these, to uh, the, the father is the same in the story. Um, so that first child who is stillborn is the younger sibling of all of these islands. Right. Same family. 
<clears throat> okay? So there's a kinship between people and, act and physical land. That's the first understanding you have to have in order to understand the way that culture develops through time of pre-contact Hawaii. Okay. And so when we understand that there's a kinship there, that first stillborn child is born, then the next child is born, that stillborn child is believed to be um, planted, uh, buried, and from the place of that birth uh, sprouts the taro plant. Okay, uh -huh. so now you have you have the islands, you have the taro plant, and you have the first uh, living born child, uh -huh. who is the, the sort of the beginning of the Hawaiian people, progenitor of the, the people of Hawaii. Okay. So now you've got this kinship relationship between the land, between this specific plant, and between the people. Uh -huh. And so as you move through time, understanding that there's a kinship between these things brings you to understand that the land upon which Hawaiians come to thrive is there's an inextricable relationship. This is not a I take care of it and, I t and it takes care of me just because that's the nature of the world. It's, it's a familial relationship. Mm -hmm. It's about respect and, 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 um, and reciprocation, right? But it's the same thing for plant, the taro plant. And the taro plant becomes the main source of, of food uh, sustenance for the people. It's the most widely grown crop. It's a crop that, that sustains you know, millions of people, a population that is huge, mm -hmm. um, and decimated at foreign contact. Mm -hmm. right? Right. Um, and so understanding that relationship is to understand the agrarian society that Hawaii develops in, um, and then the relationship between all of those things. Now, when we, we there's an ali'i system, so a chief, uh, just a chiefdom prior to, to foreign contact mm -hmm. where these chiefs ruled different sections of land. And you had chiefdoms that ranged from a chief who managed one ahupua'a or land division of a mountain from the top to the outside into the ocean. All of the resources, people lived within their means in that ahupua'a in one land division. They would get all their resources for their house, for their eating, for their fish nets, for their canoes, for everything was supplied by an ahupua, and that's where you would reside. Can you, can you explain the definition of ahu, ahu ahupua, please? Yep. So ahupua is is basically ahu is a pile of rocks, okay. sort of built into uh, maybe like an altar, um, and then pua a is a pig upon which a pig's head was placed, right. and they use those ahupua to. Um, those are like the demarcations between land divisions. Oh, so when you'd be walking along the path and you came upon an ahu hua'a, you would understand you were you were in someone else's realm oh. or neighborhood. Yeah, and as you traverse the island, you would come in and out of all mm -hmm. of these ahu hua'a that were marked by these altars. Right. Okay. So that's where the definition uh, the definition of the word comes to mean uh, the land division itself between these markers. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. I see. <clears throat> and they would spread from the top of the mountain, like I said, out into the ocean. It didn't stop at the beach. Mm -hmm. It would go out into the deep ocean because you needed the deep ocean fish and the shallow ocean fish and the shoreline in order to um, subsist. Yeah, for, for subsistence. And the people. So, yeah. So that was the idea. That was a, the smallest land division that we had. And so those were ruled by um different chiefs mm. and prior to foreign contact and prior to king kamehameha the great who you know a lot of people know about prior to that there was a lot of warring and and moving of power back and forth between these ahupua'a many ahupua'a together would make up districts which were moku okay and on oahu itself we have between depend how you divided six or seven moku mm. um so bigger land divisions and sometimes you had a chief at that level managing those uh, areas and then you had the mokupuni which are the islands and you would have a chief that would rule an island prior to foreign contact you mostly have these these chiefs who ruled the island were the top and then they'd fight back and forth between islands to sometimes you know get gain control of different islands but mostly they were individual island chiefs at the time of king kamehameha the the, the thing that he's known for is the unification of the islands mm -hmm. um, so he he goes and he wars with with all the different island chiefs and he basically joins all of the islands of hawaii under one kingdom and he that's the sort of then he becomes the king right okay. and so it's at kamehameha the first time that we then get a king a monarch that that manages this entire um uh, archipelago and so that's sort of the the progression that people are living in that kind of a way the agrarian society again 
uh, fishermen, farmers, um, bird catchers, you know, kappa makers, which are making clothes. Um, you know, it's a it's a sustainable society. Right. Uh, and then foreign influence sort of comes into the picture with Captain Cook's arrival in 1776, uh, 1778, and then um, subsequent voyages because he maps out where Hawaii is. Mm -hmm. We have many people, many boats come into Hawaii's waters, um, bringing with them diseases, bringing with them cattle, bringing with them all kinds of different things um, and starting the sort of uh, influence of outside influence on, on Hawaiian society. Right. Yeah. I think most people have no idea how complex and intertwined Hawaiian society really was back in the days. And I can totally mm -hmm. speak on the the idea of having a relationship with the land because um, I was born and raised in Houston, Texas, and I moved to the Big Island uh, for eighth grade. Mm -hmm. And so coming from Texas, there's there's no cultural connection to the land or anything like that. And I've been pretty blessed where I've been able to travel to other countries mm -hmm. and see different uh, cultures and things like that. And this place here where we are is the only place I know where there's a real connection and love for the land. So I, mm. I think it's really interesting. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Um, I was also wondering if you could briefly <clears> touch <throat> on the economic systems back then. And because I know it was mostly, there was no currency really. It was mostly trading, if I'm right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, sort of, a, yeah, a bartering system. Um, the, the, the taro farmers would trade their, their taro and their poi mm. uh, with the fishermen to get, but um, you had sometimes you had families who did both, you know. You had, you, but it, living in an ahupua'a, you had all your resources, and there was a shared. It, it was a. It was about sharing. Um, when the fishermen would go out, everyone would go down to the beach. They would get their fish, um, and they would take whatever they had, whatever trade they had, whatever their thing was. If I was a bird catcher, I might have you know some feathers, and I might uh, trade that for you know feathers being valuable. Trade that if I was a you know, I make um, a length of, of kappa or tapa cloth, the cloth for blankets and things like that, I might trade that. Um, if I had, you know, bananas or if I had an extra pig or things that, that, that people were taking care of, everybody shared in their, um, in the production and then the trade of, of goods. Yeah, because I think I remember reading somewhere, uh, tell me if I'm wrong, but I think, it, it was kind of like some of the districts weren't all created equally and some districts produced uh, items that others did not have. So they would trade and sort of almost like look out for each other in a way. Yeah. Right. Yep. And, and, you know, and then not look out for each other too. I mean, I don't want to romanticize the history of Hawaii at all <laughs> and say that, you know, everything was beautiful and everybody had everything they needed. Um, I'm sure there were people who did not have things that they needed. Totally. If you lived in a place like Kau on the Big Island, you might have a hard time getting, you know, fresh water. Uh, and so the, the hike would be long to get your fresh water and you would use it, you would, you would use it very sparingly, um, but you might need a lot of fish, right? And um, you would be rich in other ways. So there were places in Hawaii that definitely um, grew good things. And if you were close enough, you would trade and if you weren't, I, I think there were places where you, you didn't have everything that you, maybe you wanted. Totally, yes. Yeah. Um, so in my junior year here at Punahou, uh, we're looking at US history through the lens of caste and race. Mm -hmm. but, and I was wondering if you could sort of tell me how life was different and how long the colonization period was uh, when, when white settlers came and like people such as Captain Cook came and how mm -hmm. that changed because I know uh, once, the col once the colonizers came, uh, people started buying land, like the term of, of buying land was introduced and currency was introduced and sickness came and so much other stuff came. So not to get into much detail, but if you can yeah. just explain. Yeah, super complex history. And, and you know, I'll try to do it justice and, and not make any sort of sweeping statements. But like I said, like romanticizing the history of Hawaii, Hawaii's population was getting very, very big. Mm -hmm. And sustainability would have become a question at some point. Um, because we are, we do live on islands and we have finite resources. And so I don't tend to, I don't want to romanticize the history. A lot of people say like, you know, looking at our modern issues, if we look backwards, you know, there's, you know, we should live like the Hawaiians live. And I think that that's such a broad statement. There are pieces of that society that I think if we brought into the, into this future, into our modern day, they would give us some answers to some questions and give us some good foundations for addressing some of our modern 
pose. But I don't want to pretend that everything was hunky dory. <laughs> you know, like it wasn't. They they did have their own issues. And part of you know when we look at it, sort of in retrospect, with you know rose co colored glasses, um, you know there is an interesting little way we we look at cast, and we have, you know, within the Hawaiian system. And I remember doing this too in in um in my time at Punahou studying you know uh, European history and and uh, Middle Eastern history and all kinds of things. And I remember learning about the caste system in terms of India. And when I learned about Hawaii, I, I thought, oh, it's really similar. Uh -huh. And Hawaiians, you have the Maka'aidana, you have the bottom, the most of your population are Maka'aidana. They are the commoners. They're the people who are doing the fishing and the, um, the, the farming and making sure that, you know, there's all the stuff people need to survive. Uh -huh. Then you have the um, warriors or the, the core class, like, and, and they're sort of a class of their own um, because each ali'i had to have their army, right? right. Each ali'i had to have, make sure their army was provisioned and that they, you know, were safe. Mm -hmm. um, then you had the, the uh, kahuna and the kahuna are the priestly class and they're held in high regard because they're sort of the right hand man to the ali'i, to the chiefs. Um, because, you know, they're doing the prophecies, they're reading the signs of the, the world, they're spiritual advisors, mm -hmm. they're the ones who are saying, yeah, this is a good day to go to war, nope, this is not a good day to go to war, yes, you should go take over that place right now, no, you should not go do that, right, so they're the advisors, so they have a lot of power, okay. and then you get up to the Ali'i, and that's the, the chiefly class, but within the Ali'i itself, there's a lot of different, um, uh, ranks and nobilities so as you move through the chiefly class but in general those are the classes and then you had a very small a population who are the kawa or the outcasts and those are people who had been um you know wrongfully uh, uh done something wrong or committed crimes or um you know maybe they're like the 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 refugees the war refugees or you know that come into like flee and show up in a place and they don't really have a kuleana so there's there's also the the outcast um in in ancient hawaii too okay. um when we get to the point of king kamehameha and he unites all the islands he becomes the king and that's when you get this extra level you still have all of the chiefs and their nobility but they're managed they become land managers they become more of like um you know people who who manage their own spaces but under the the malu or the the sort of reign of a of a king a monarch um so that changes the dynamic a little bit you were going to ask a question sorry yeah so like did did real colonization <laughs> occur when king kamehameha was in power well it's an interesting question right because we think a lot about colonization as um what in the context of the white man mm -hmm. right? right but we don't think necessarily about colonization in terms of the actual root of the word. Mm -hmm. And so I I think, you know, it would be a controversial statement for me to come out in public and say, King Kamehameha was the original colonizer. Right. Right? Yeah. That wouldn't go over too well, I don't think. Yeah. But when you think about what the meaning of the word is, how can we not analyze Kamehameha's actions as a colonization of the islands? Yeah, I totally agree. Yeah. But then in even in, in that analysis, when you're moving backwards down into the, the, the lower ranks of chiefs and back into time, each chief was responsible for colonizing their own district. Mm -hmm. Right. And so if we're using the English terminology in the way that it, as far as understanding its etymology, mm -hmm. then I think that's a fair analysis. OK. Right. But controversial. <laughs> yeah. uh, because, because of course, we know now that colonization comes with a whole lot of baggage that doesn't have to necessarily do with the etymology of the word, more of the, the baggage that's collected as a rolling stone, you know, that's gathering no moss over time. Mm. So, you know, that's a different um, analysis of it. As far as foreign, foreign influence um, is concerned, there, like I said, in 1778, um, uh, Captain Cook comes to Hawaii, his cartographers put Hawaii on the map. When he gets back to England, he's like, people are looking at the maps and now all kinds of explorers are, are aiming for Hawaii and trying to find it. Mm. So you've got a lot of traffic in Hawaiian waters through that late part of the um, 1700s 
early part of the 1800s, that's when colonization, the, the, the seeds of colonization are planted. Okay. So when you ask me about the duration of time that colonization happens in Hawaii, mm -hmm. it's a huge long period of time. Right. And as far as pinpointing it back to a certain event, um, the, the furthest back we can go is Captain Cook, mm -hmm. right? Captain Cook is the initial seed of that event, but right. he doesn't colonize the Hawaiian Islands, not by a long shot, mm -hmm. right? He's at the mercy of all of these chiefs. And we know that, why? Because they end up killing him. Mm, yep. He, he doesn't he doesn't colonize Hawaii. Right. They kill him because he's overstepping his boundary in Hawaii. Mm. And the chiefdom is still very much alive and well. And so he he kind of you know steps in it himself. But then there's a lot of other people who come here. Vancouver being one of them. Mm -hmm. Vancouver bringing the um, cattle to Hawaii, giving them as gifts to um, Kamehameha. Kamehameha placing a, a taboo on the head of the cattle. Nobody can touch them. They get free reign. And pretty soon they're like all over the place running amok. And they take over. And you lived in Waimea, the cowboy country of, totally. of Hawaii. And they bring in the vaqueros from California to mm -hmm. teach Hawaiians how to wrangle you know, cattle. Because they cannot, at some point in the, during Kamehameha the Third's reign, they have to get control of these cows that are, you know, taking over places. Mm -hmm. And so the, the Paniolo culture is born. Um, so there's all kinds of different, there's a, you can trace this colonization and influence mm -hmm. through lots of different mediums, you know, mm -hmm. in Hawaii, through transportation, through um, political ruler, um, through uh, the evolution and the, the development of a literate literacy. Um, you can take any thread and you can sort of follow it through the history of time in Hawaii, and you can teach Hawaiian history and evolution of colonization through that, I think. Mm -hmm. But yeah. it's not one thing. Now, Kamehameha is on his deathbed in the early uh, 1800s, 1820, 1920s. Yeah. And just so happened, the missionaries arrive just after his death. Now, yeah. what happens when a chief dies, and him being the king, this is like, you know, times 100. What happens in that mo period after... A, the, the passing of a chief is that the all the kapu, all the taboos that that guide life and in the in society in Hawaii mm -hmm. are, are laid to rest for a certain period of time, so that people can mourn and people can um, they don't have to necessarily follow all the rules of society because it's that period of grief. The the chief who takes over uh, takes those taboo away. And then at a certain point reinstates the taboo mm -hmm. to signify that, that the grieving period is over. Right. What happens in the case of Kamehameha is that there's so much foreign influence that has already happened that the taboos of society are starting to be questioned by some of the, the, the commoners, but by some of the chiefs too. Okay. So people who have heavy, heavy taboos, chiefs of high, high rank, they're like lonely. They're like, geez, man, I want some friends, you know, yes. probably not that simple, but that sentiment, right? The human sentiment of having such heavy taboo, it's starting to be questioned. So when, when Liho Liho Kamehameha II um, opens the period of mourning, what essentially happens is they're in a period of mourning, right? And he doesn't reinstate it right away. Mm -hmm. And so the missionaries arrive. Yeah. Yeah. In this time of turmoil. And they start talking about this God that they have is who is super great and who is very loving and a, is a God of peace and a God of love and a God of compassion. And Hawaiians are not stupid. They're like, I like that God. That sounds great. Mm -hmm. And there are people who still want to remain loyal to the old ways. But there are a lot of people who are interested in looking for a new way forward. And what Liho Liho does not do is he does not reinstate the taboos okay. after the death of his father. He doesn't reinstate, which means then that all of these old taboos sort of get overturned. So uh, real quick, is it safe to say that uh, when, when King Kamehameha was on his deathbed, uh, there was a large influx of, uh, call, of like um, missionaries and people that were not native to this land coming to Hawaii? Um, I, I, I don't even, I think that there were still 
explorers, whalers, traders. There was a, a, a large number of foreign people in Hawaii at that time. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, yes, they were there. There was a presence for sure. Yeah, because I can kind of almost trace that back to like the roots of environmental racism in Hawaii, because back then they came, they claimed their land. They said, uh, according to, according to what I believe in in my rules, I own this land now. So well, okay, so that doesn't happen quite yet, though at Kamehameha's time, because Kamehameha is still very much in charge. Mm -hmm. And when he gives it over, when he passes away and Liholiho takes it, Liholiho is still very much in charge. Okay, and he's telling what's going on. When the missionaries come, the thing that the missionaries do is that they make friends with the ali'i. Mm -hmm. And they teach the ali'i to read and write. They become friends with the ali'i. The, it's only um, after Liholiho Kamehameha III, Kaui Keoli, he declares Hawaii a Christian nation. Mm, okay. But he's still very much in charge. Now, what ends up happening is these, there's all these foreign people in Hawaii. None of them are claiming land. They okay. are given land. Some people are because of their friendships with the ali'i right like the way that punahou school comes in to the possession of the binghams and yep, the abc of them right but that is those are gifts mm -hmm. it's not till the great mahele that the that this whole idea of land ownership in hawaii changes mm -hmm. that then foreign influencers are given the opportunity to obtain land mm. for themselves that is not a gift from the ali'i. Okay. So a little bit down the road is when that begins to happen. But what, so, so it's, so that to me is where one of the big events that ha happens that changes in terms of environmental racism, mm -hmm. because here's what happens. You have a literate nation of about 96 to 98% is the, is the wow. um, sort of gesture, mm -hmm. but people, so people can read, people have been learned how to read. They learn how to write. Hawaiians are like the most literate people in the nation in that time. Okay. But the newspapers don't necessarily make it to Ka'u. Mm. The newspapers don't necessarily make it to, you know, um, Upolu Valley. You know, there's, there's a lot of places that the newspapers don't go. So what ends up happening is the great Mahele, you need to claim your land. Every Hawaiian is given the opportunity to claim the land that mm. they are, have been living on, but they they didn't get the memo right right and then the ones who are in the back country those are the two percent that they don't know how to read right so it's the uneducated it's the ones who haven't given up their the ones who are still farming the ones who haven't flocked to the city who end up landless and therefore poor and then removed and then destitute Mm -hmm. Right. So that's the first there's that's one of the first instances in which this environmental racism has a huge effect on Hawaiians. Right. Is the disposition the, the, the displacement from the land that has been genealogically passed down through family and not passed down in ownership, passed down in responsibility in Kuleana. Mm -hmm. Kuleana means privilege and responsibility. Right. So Kuleana means privilege and responsibility. And because of that, it means that when I'm given a kuleana parcel of land, it means I have a privilege to live there as long as I take care of my responsibility of making it productive. I see. Okay. Now, when I'm removed from the land and I'm a farmer, what do I do? Where do I go? Yeah, that's, that's, you go, you go to less, more undesirable places of land. That, that's, that's kind of the whole idea. And then that's, I don't, I don't know. I mean, that's, that's. What we're here, to, what that's not like what we're here to talk about today, basically, because, I mean, if you kind of bring it to modern day, almost, you there's still there's still many traces of this. An example is, uh, on Kauai with the GMO spraying, because that land is zoned to agriculture, and uh, companies like Monsanto came, they can spray whatever pesticides they want. And I remember I remember reading in in the news, um, I think it was the Waimea Middle School they had to be evacuated because of the pesticide right. spray that that right. that uh, was blown over the fields. So mm -hmm. I mean, there's still lasting effects of environmental racism from way back in those days. And mm -hmm. I think it's really hard to, to break out of the, out of, out of that box. Of course. And so what we what we basically establish early on in Hawaii is a business model, right. Of mm -hmm. running, um, running the country. So it's a country back then. Mm -hmm. So it's a business model and profit and things like that. Um, when Kamehameha, when 
Kalaka, it progresses over time, larger and larger, you know, um, foreign influence, um, missionary children. So this is the other misnomer that I kind of want to talk about is that the missionaries don't come to colonize Hawaii. They mm -hmm. don't come here to that. And they don't do it. They become friends with Ali. They teach Ali how to read and write. They have no desire to take over. They establish Punahou school so they don't have to send their kids away to the continent to go get educated. Right? Okay, sorry about that. We had brief technical difficulties, but we're back. <laughs> if you want to pick up where you left off. Yep. So just, you know, sort of addressing the fact that a lot of people blame the missionaries for the colonization of Hawaii. Mm -hmm. And and it's an easy place to go back to. It really is. It's super easy to go there and say, yeah, that's the reason. There's the, the honest to God truth is there's so much foreign influence that happens, you know, for 40 years prior to the arrival of the missionaries that it's hard it, when you really look at it and understand the history. It's inextricable from the, you know, the, the influence that's happening. And so the, the, the influence, though, that the missionaries has is a little bit different because they come in and they teach the Ali'i to read and write. Mm -hmm. And they become fast friends with the Ali'i. And they, uh, the Ali'i come to understand what, um, what kind of like education, like a formal education, what kind of benefits that would have for their people. And so schools are established and things like that. Meanwhile, while the missionaries are still sending their own kids back to the continent to be educated. So Punahou School gets its origins from that, from the missionaries wanting a place here in Hawaii to educate their own children. So they established Punahou School. The kids that stay here and get educated here, those unfortunately become, and they're no longer missionaries, they're not considered missionaries, they're missionary children. They are the ones who go away, get educated, come back to Hawaii, and then take over the government. Mm -hmm. They're businessmen at that time. They're American businessmen, but they're citizens of Hawaii. And so this kind of happens from the inside out. And that's the place where the colonization and, and our sort of our, our path, Hawaii's path towards this economic um, sort of uh, society develops. Now we're all about the money and the profit. We're getting into the sugar business, right? We're, we're pro harbor, where you know leads to territorial state overthrow. All of that is a result of the desire of for business to thrive in Hawaii and for these these um, businessmen to be able to make a lot of money I here see. in Hawaii. Okay. And so all of those that it's that it's sort of that route that takes us into this world of business. Now, when we talk about environmental racism, this is where because the displacement of Hawaiians through the great Mahele is one thing, right? And then over time, what we what we have is that this displacement of Hawaiians reaches into the far corners of Hawaii uh, for different in different ways. Now, one of the residual uh, modern issues that we're looking at is the fact that it is houselessness, right, mm -hmm. and poverty levels. Totally. But it also is. Um, the sickness, the rates of sickness, diabetes and cancer and all this kind of stuff that Hawaiians and then incarceration. I see. All of these issues, in my opinion, are a result of, of this, this environmental racism, because when we look over time at the most desired properties on Hawaii and our our desire to sell properties to foreign interests, because foreign interests have a lot of money. We've put the priority of making money over the well-being of our own people. And to me, that's environmental racism, right? Totally. But that doesn't only happen against Hawaiians. It happens primarily against Hawaiians, but it has happened to people living in Hawaii for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. Now, one of, the, one of the things you do is if this, it's illustrated in a very um, interesting way in, say, the case of Lanikai. Okay. Yeah, Kailua. Mm -hmm. A place called Ka'ohao, a fishing village traditionally. Mm -hmm. And and I, like we know, everybody desires beachfront property in Hawaii because that's the paradise. Mm -hmm. But these are places where fishing villages thrive. People who knew how to fish and use the ocean, they live there. Mm -hmm. And so if you take a place like Lanikai, you say, oh, this is such a beautiful place. You got a bunch of Hawaiians with their little shacks living along the beach in this little area, a nice village. You got one family maybe who leaves or has medical issues and needs to sell their property. 
So they sell their property, but other Hawaiians can't afford to buy it. Their subsistence living does not allow them to have cash on hand or to even get a loan from the bank. Hawaiians can't be buying this land. So who buys it? Foreigners. I see. Huh? Foreigner comes in and buys the property. They don't want to live in a shack. Mm -hmm. So they fix the house up. Now, the law in Hawaii that is that deals with property tax, this property tax, this is the number one culprit mm -hmm. of environmental racism that we still have till today. Because what happens when I fix up that little shack and I build a nice little house, my property tax goes up. Mm. But in Hawaii, not only your property tax goes up, the two people on the side of you, their property tax goes up. Right. Now, what have you done to those two Hawaiian families that are living there? Now they, because they're only subsistence livers, fishermen, mm -hmm. they now cannot afford their property tax. Right. So what do they have to do? They have to sell. Mm -hmm. So now you got two more foreign people, you got three in a row, and now you are affecting five properties. Mm -hmm. And it's a domino effect and it happens and it wipes out entire communities in a matter of a short period of time. Now, if we had went in and we recognized that that one law that, that facilitates this property tax and its effect on local families, and we changed that one law and we said something like, if you renovate your property, you get a higher property tax, but the people next to you, no change in their property tax, unless in the future they sell. And at the time that they sell, the property tax will go up and the new owner will begin to pay that new property tax. Right. But if we did that, it wouldn't force people out of their homes, but it would still apply the property tax necessary when there's a transfer of ownership. Now, if we were to do that, that would be helping the problem. Mm -hmm. it still wouldn't solve it. But that law itself about property tax, it's a culprit of, of in, in environmental racism mm -hmm. because it has been the reason that Hawaiians have been displaced, local families have been displaced, and that people have to move into high rises and give up their, their fishing and, and farming practices because now they, they have to live in a high rise and they don't have any land to farm. They don't have any place to keep all their fishing supplies. Holy so you're, you're basically, it's cultural genocide along mm -hmm. with this, this displacement um, from land. Mm -hmm. I totally agree. I haven't, I haven't really, I hadn't really like before talking about this thought about the, like, about like the, the housing taxes and how that totally affects the environmental racism. But uh, one thing I did read was also another uh, article from Civil Beat and it was talking about how uh, like the Evo Plains and, uh, and like the Waianae Coast are totally affected by environmental racism because they have all the coal power, all the power plants, landfills, uh, like all the industrial areas are in are in those areas, and basically what the article was saying was that they're seeing higher rates of uh, disease and, and cancer and things like that. But not only that, why why are they there? Where where is the highest concentration on Oahu of Hawaiian homelands? Is it out there too? Out there too, right? And and so because the state has given up those lands for Hawaiian homelands, mm -hmm. they put everything else out there too. Right, and basically what the article was saying was that. They're trying to connect um, all these cancers and, and diseases to the fact that these people have to live in these areas with all these industrial sites, but they don't think mm -hmm. that there is probable cause and there's not enough, there's just not enough things in the news going on to like really raise awareness towards it. So yeah. they don't think there's a real solution. The, well, the, the biggest problem I think is that Hawaii is a business and, and um, economically driven state. That, that the economics um, drives our politics, the drives our decision making, drives everything. Now, when we see Red Hill, now Red Hill is, a, so for those of people listening in, the Flint, Michigan, you know, issue is, is something that we just had to deal with here. Now, interestingly, it happened to the military, mm -hmm. but it not only affected the military, it affected a bunch of people living around that military um, sort of compound. Now the Red Hill issue and the, the leakage of, of jet fuel into the watershed, into the aquifer of, of our area, like being polluted, the pos potential for it polluting our aquifer under Oahu is the closest we have come to something like a Flint, Michigan, right? Mm -hmm. But when we think about environment and they're, they're gonna decommission those, those fuel tanks, hopefully, they're gonna decommission those fuel tanks 
And that would be a huge win in terms of this state pushing for something that is good for the people versus good for the economy. Mm. And more of those decisions have to be made if we're ever going to address this idea of environmental racism. Totally. The problem is the value of money in this state is, is something that we have to change. And the culture of decision making based on economics is something that's going to have to change for us to even address this, this issue of environmental racism. Totally. And I, I think that tourism plays a large role in this because tourists want to come to Hawaii and they want, they want to go to the beaches, they want to go to the very pristine parts of the island. And if they need to build hotels, infrastructure for all them to come, then it pushes everyone else out towards the less desirable land. And, and I mean, honestly, I think as long as money is a big factor in tourism is alive in Hawaii, I don't, I don't know if there will be much of a difference. Well, and not only that, like, I mean, the infrastructure to house tourism is one issue. But when you're adding that many people to our daily population, mm. um, then then what does the quality of life look like? Oh. Because tourists are adding to traffic, they're adding to to congestion on the beaches, they're adding to you know the the, the wear and tear on our roads. They're adding they're, the tourism industry is adding so much cost burden to right. what it is that 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 we you know to a society that we live in, um, and the only way we sort of uh count what they're contributing is through the money that they're spending in our stores or in our hotels and we it's almost like the water bottle issue right the cost of of producing a water bottle there's so much hidden cost mm -hmm. to being able to produce that one bottle of water that when we say oh it only costs a dollar it's the cheapest option we're we're putting the cheapest economic option up above all the other environmental costs that that you know where we have to a uh, home and oven we be patient with to get that bottle of water. And when we think about tourism, yeah, they're injecting our economy, but the, the cost we end up spending in order to maintain our infrastructure to keep them here mm -hmm. is if we zeroed it out, what, what right. would happen, you know? Yeah. I, the I pandemic, mean, we saw it in the pandemic, everybody's quality of life went through the roof. Mm, everybody's, everybody now is like, come on, let's break. Can we go back to quarantine? Not for the pandemic, but. Can we just like quarantine again? Splendid isolation in Japan. That whole thing that, that, that how Japan decided to just close off their borders mm -hmm. to, you know, look at themselves. Like, I think I've, I think about that all the time and think, wow, if Hawaii did that, what, what could we accomplish? Yeah. If we went into a period of spend, splendid isolation to plant, you know, enough food mm -hmm. that we wouldn't have to rely on anybody else. And, and then we opened up to tourism in a way that was actually sustainable. So many people per year, so many people per month, certain kinds of activities. You want to come to Hawaii? Let us tell you what you should see. Right. This is not a free for all, you know? Yeah. I mean, I, I have a brother that lives in Tokyo and he would, we were, we wanted to go visit him, but obviously the borders were closed, but he was like, oh, it's great here because it's just so much more relaxed and it's just like a better way of life. But I mean, going back to, uh, talking about tourism since the idea of like money is such a big thing here. I think we're kind of just like a negative, a negative loop almost because even though people don't like tourism here because it causes environmental racism and pushes people towards undesirable land, they have to, it, it, um, like tourism creates jobs and, and, and it can sustain people's families. So it's really mm -hmm. a complicated idea. I, and on top of that, it's construction, right? Mm -hmm. Construction too. Um, you want to talk about affordable housing, people, this whole idea of affordable housing and developing land to create affordable housing, it, that's a negative loop too. It's like, wait, at some point, it doesn't, ah. this doesn't play out well. But this doesn't so actually make sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're so far gone in that direction where I don't think we can come back. So we just have to keep going with it. But mm -hmm. I do think that we're we're, we are running out of time a little bit. So yeah. <laughs> for my <laughs> for my final question, I just wanted to ask, um, what 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 can the average person do 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 like how can the average person mitigate environmental racism and like are there any are there any like services or programs going on that are trying to restore the land back to how it was? Yeah, I mean, yes, I think there are a lot of nonprofits. There's a lot of people doing a lot of good work. Um, I think, you know, one of the, we have a refugee crisis too. You know, we have a lot of Micronesians here in Hawaii 
who have come because of the, the idea that America went over there and bombed Micronesia with nuclear bombs and have displaced a lot of people. And so that's a whole other issue of environmental racism that we're dealing with and we're having to deal with other peoples, other places, sort of issues of environmental racism too. So there are a lot of levels that this issue can is affecting our society and a lot of ways then for us to get involved. So getting involved with helping underserved populations in any capacity is a win. Um, but helping and serving in ways that those communities need us to help and serve, you know, and not necessarily overlaying, like checking our own privilege and bias. And it's not just, you know, white people. It's about, it's privilege. And knowing, understanding, I think, our own privilege individually and our own biases individually first helps us to walk a little bit more carefully through the world and to make sure that we are paying attention to all of the different ways in which environmental racism are affecting our world. Um, and, and no, not one person can solve all the issues, but if we are educated around about this issue, and if we are understanding of our own a sort of context, then I think we will find ways and keep our eyes open for ways to help address these issues, whether it's in decision making in, in the bills that we support, the people we vote into office who are going to speak for us. Um, being educated about all of these different um, issues and making sure we as individuals hold people's feet to the fire. For people whose poleana it is to address and make Hawaii a better place for us to live, like let's demand that from them. And in our own jobs and in our own work, let's demand that from ourselves. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's the way we start. Yeah, I completely agree with you. I think that um, the only way to create real change is to create publicity and then real change will come with education, I think. And then also taking a look at the legal system and the zoning systems mm -hmm. and, and making a change. Another, yep. Yeah. One other can of worms. Yeah. <laughs> I really appreciate you being able to talk with me and give me some insight about this because I think most people have no idea how complex it is and people just don't even know the history of our land. So I think mm -hmm. it's, really, it's really great to learn. Yeah. Thank you, Seth, for having me, for, for letting me just kind of talk through a bunch of these ideas and, and yeah, awesome work you're doing. Thank you. Thank you.